Okay, um, now I'm going to cover a bit how brass works. Wait, 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 you gotta get down to brass tacks. Brass is an alloy made of copper and zinc, that's how it works. <laughs> that was timely. <laughs> I'm a metallurgist! This is all solid gold, or should I say solid brass? Audio tracks of yes. the laughter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, let's let's settle down. I realise like you can just see how excited we are about this incredibly dry sounding game that is anything but. Okay, uh, Alexis, Alexis, please edit out all these five minutes. No, it's gold. <laughs> it's solid brass. David, go ahead. Hello and welcome to The Last Standy, a board game podcast coming to you from four exciting countries across Europe. I'm joined here today by Alessio. In quarantine, hello. Audrey. Bonjour, bonjour. David. <laughs> Audrey. Bonjour, bonjour. David. <laughs> hello. <laughs> and I'm your host, Fen. Unfortunately, Alexis can't be with us this week, uh, but I'm sure he'll be joining us next time. Uh, so we're going to be talking about a range of different topics across the hobby. And today we'll start with the standee catch-up. Who wants to grab that ball? And today we'll start with the standee catch-up. Who wants to grab that ball? Yeah, so what's so amusing, David? Oh, I'm in pretty good <laughs> mood because uh, actually like... Uh, I got the approval to start like some weight training with my wrist, which yeah. is like fantastic. And also to start like some weight training with my wrist, yeah. which is like fantastic. And also um, I will not no longer be on sick leave starting a April 1st. So things are starting to move along with my wrist, which is amazing. Yeah, super cool. So we are seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. In your way. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, that not so not not equally good. But anyway, we are managing to cope up with it. Uh, my my nephew has he has COVID, so uh, all the family is quarantined. So that that's a lot. Of, I enjoyed our game, uh, so to speak, of Brass Birmingham this week. But. Uh, um, so it's a bit Spoiler crazy. Alert. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, uh, being quarantined really drives you crazy after a bit because you have the kids uh, doing school from remote from remotely, and that, that that's terrible. That's plain terrible. Uh, I know that the teachers and everyone that they are doing a wonderful job, really, but uh, having the kids all the time uh, drives you crazy. <laughs> and that's my week. <laughs> Audrey? Uh. And that's my week. <laughs> Audrey, how uh, about you? Yesterday we played the a, a round of King's Dilemma with Alexis and uh, one of her patrons and my boyfriend. So it was our fifth turn and we managed patrons and my boyfriend. So it was our fifth turn and we managed to finish one storyline. Uh, it was very fun because my boyfriend didn't understand exactly how uh, Prestige and Crave, uh, not exactly how they work, but what do they gain you? And we said, oh, it's probably narr something narrative at the end of the game. And he was like, oh, you see his um, family chart and tell him, okay, so you see here you have lots of this symbol, so you kind of want to get more of this one to get a nice ending. And he was, oh, 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 yes, I'm doing, going to do this. So mm -hmm. it was it was a really fun moment. Yeah, inside is 2020, like they say. Both. <laughs> um, I, I just gonna say on that on that subject, um, uh, the uh, YouTube channel part of Rooster Teeth Funhouse has started uh, for their Borders Hell season. Instead of doing separate board games, they're doing a whole run through of King's Dilemma this time. Um, yeah, the first episode, some of them have gone. Oh, full, I, 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 play I character. watched that one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Very enjoyable. I would probably watch that... a playthrough of King's Dilemma, but hoping that they picked uh, different big choices than we did. That, that's yeah. funny and silly. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, full of spoilers. Actually, I, I don't because uh, everything I say having completed the game is a spoiler. Yeah, yeah don't, don't, spoil. With... don't spoil. Don't yep. spoil. 
Same with any legacy game, you've got to watch out for those spoilers. That's one of the tricky things about reviewing them, especially if they do like a mid-game, mid-story turn of some kind, which is, you know, even just saying for some people, that's like, oh, that's a spoiler. I remember sitting down to watch The Sixth Sense for the first time and the people I was watching with went, oh, I love the twist in this. And I was like, all right, well, I'm done because my brain's just going to be looking for the twist and looking for the clues to the twist. I'm, go- I'm going to quote my boyfriend. You mean the twist that is that Bruce Willis is... Yes, and I was like, all right, well, uh, I'm done because my brain's just going to be looking for the twist and looking for the clues to the twist. I'm, go- I'm going to quote my boyfriend. You mean the twist that is that Bruce Willis is a psychologist, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was a hell that of a twist because I, yeah. I didn't see it coming because <laughs> he, he, he was terrible. <laughs> yeah, he was, a, he was a terrible psychologist, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was a hell that of a twist, twist cuz I, yeah. I didn't see it coming because he <laughs> he, he was terrible. <laughs> yeah, he was a he was a terrible psychologist. He was absolutely awful, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's a, pff, not a very good movie in my opinion, but you know, uh, people What about you, fan? Me? Uh ooh. ooh. Let's see. I I try to think really. Um I've been continuing to expand my um my Roland Roland Wright collection, the famed board game serial killer. Um yep. Welshman he is, Roland Wright. Uh, I got Railroad Inc. because oh. Shut Up and Sit Down are doing a new on their Twitch channel and so I was like, I wanna I, I wanna join in on that because it I, I, kind I, of you know, makes no, me feel like I'm playing with people from Britain again. Yeah, and actually, uh, I think like the Rodink is uh, from Yalmarak again, right? I couldn't tell you. The box is over the other side of the room. I'm not getting up to oh, okay. it. Okay, I, I think it's one of his design. I, I googled that because it's important. Anyway, that, that that's I think the coolest roll and write game I I heard of in the last at, at least six months. Of course, it. It is. Uh, it has a bit of problems, but it's for uh, for another day. Um, let you form uh, an opinion, and anyway, super cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, every game has its problems, so mm. I, I'm never gonna yep. worry about that. Not every game can be Concordia. You know. Ah, uh, yeah, of uh, course. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I didn't play Concordia, yeah. so I have to. to, to you have not played Concordia. That. That's a real shame. Like, yeah, I know, I know. I know. Thing- yeah, everyone should play Concordia. Um, uh, let's see what's well. I, I've sort of been keeping an eye on bits and pieces going on here and there. Um, the uh, I, I, I'm not going to get into magic in any big details. Magic the Gathering, that is. But you mean the, you mean the um, video game, right? <laughs> Trying to get to the point where we can play together because you have to oh. spend three hours before being able to make a grab. Oh, I uh, wasn't even going to get into the video game. I played the video game, and Raal, in the in the intro, lagged my computer out so badly that I couldn't get any further. Because every time he spoke, everything locked up. Oh, I don't <laughs> have that po- issue, but my computer is making yeah. Doom Eternal. It's okay. Uh, I, I've I've watched uh, the stream and Noxious um, play a bit of it, so I could actually see what's going on. And I was like, this is this is not what I want. The, when he opened up the menus. I was just like, I don't understand anything that's going on here at all. There, there's no tutorial explanation. Oh boy, um, I don't know what half these things do. Actually, going to talk about um, the card game briefly, because oh. I don't know if you guys have heard about it. This <laughs> In a big departure this year, first of all, they're expanding to include a D&D-based set. And oh. Space they... Marines. Yes, yeah, they're doing 40k and Lord oh. of the Rings. They're doing a whole Lord of the Rings set and then some kind of 40k tie-in that they and Lord oh. of the Rings. They're doing a whole Lord of the Rings set and then some kind of 40k tie-in that they maybe Commander decks or something they've not talked about exactly. Uh, and uh, people are like, uh, I don't know what to make of this really. I mean, like yeah, the Godzilla I, stuff I... that came out was fun. Um, but they were alternate art versions of cards you could get normally. Like Mothra was fun. Um, but they were alternate art versions of cards you could get normally. Like Mothra was just a normal moth if you wanted the basic card. So we'll have to see. Um, the Walking Dead secret lair was a, like a huge misstep for the for the game, but it's proven to be really popular. And uh, Negan now has his own deck in Legacy, ridiculously broken. If you want to spend five hundred dollars to get four copies of him of whatever it is, you know. Yeah, that, that's that. that's exactly what I was thinking. I'm aligned with the community. I don't know what c- I can make of it. <laughs> I don't yeah. know what to think about it. I don't know if I like I, it. I don't think so. I, I don't know. I mean, um, I, again, just a few time spiral remastered, and apparently that is amazing, um, but there's not enough stock, so the prices have skyrocketed already on it. 
um, you know, so <laughs> either, either way, I, I like keeping an eye on everything and going, I'm ever so glad I barely bother playing this game. But uh, I, I used to play it competitively, so I like to just like play. Uh, well, they managed to smack the wheel off a, off a coach twice within 20 minutes. <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's lovely. You, you got you got to love going. Everyone going. Okay, so who's going to drive this coach? Because the coachmen are like they're, they're, they're <laughs> drunk and hungover, and they don't want to stop driving. It's That's, incredible. It's, it's incredible. Our our playing yeah. games always yeah. boil down to this stuff. <laughs> Ignoring the stats. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah of uh, course. They're, they're about to encounter their first big major plot point, and it should be quite a bit of fun. Um, the Foundry app we use, like the way it handles everything, I'm just trying to get the Fog of War to work correctly on the maps, so players just kind of see what their character can see, and as they move around, they unveil the map. Um, that was a disaster on the first attempt, but uh, <laughs> it made for a nice cliffhanger. So, yeah, that's that's more or less it. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, that's that's more or less it. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Oh, you have you have a lot of co going for you, so please go on, go on. <laughs> no, I, I was I was just gonna say that uh, at this point now it's time to get on to our um our main topic and uh, our board games. And it's gonna say I got a little bit of a preamble because it turns out and, uh, our board games. And it's gonna say I got a little bit of a preamble because it turns out all three of these have a fair bit in common. But the main thread for me is that they're all about tech trees. And tech trees are a mechanic that has been around for a pretty long time and made most famous by video games, but they originate from board games, from board games, and they've kind of come back in. Um, for those of you few f number, small amount who are not completely familiar with what a tech tree is, it's effectively a series of powers that you unlock and then they unlock further things behind them. Um, famously, as I said, Civilization has them, Twilight Imperium has them for its technology, uh, and Kingdom Death has its own tech tree buried into the innovation deck, giving you a semi-random tech tree. Uh, it's, it's a fun mechanic because it rewards people following a certain path, and those paths can be different for different players. And uh, nothing is more like like exemplified by this than the first entry of the games we're going to be talking about. This is the one that uh, everyone apart from me has had the least um, contact with, so it's probably going to be the shortest section. And that is a board game from Dennis Chan, or Dennis K. Chan, to be precise. Uh, it's his first board game. He's a software engineer and physicist from Hong Kong who moved to Boston. Um, and he's done a heck of a job on this, and it's Beyond the Sun from Rio Grande Games. It came out last year, kind of sold out straight away. No pun intended, did a... a no pun included. Um, Alexis, cut that. A no pun included, did a, um, a video on it, and then the second edition came out, and that sold out as well. I had to make do with getting a copy that's got a dinged-up box which I was happy enough with. But most recently, Rio Grande have released an official TTS mod. So, so you can go to Tabletop Simulator and play it. It's nicely scripted in that it'll set the game up for you, but it doesn't try and do everything, which um, is where scripted stuff can go horribly wrong. Um, now, it's uh, a space civilization game. Uh, it's set, I think, after the... Third, therm third thermonuclear war of humanity or something like post post apocalypse but uh, it's the dawn of the spacefaring era and you're one of four different factions vying to be the leading kind of group for science economics galactic influence and conquering the, it is effectively the vast majority of the game tech tree the game you're you, you've got a ton of things but the main driving force is constructing these uh, these technologies um, and the, the board this gigantic board is just a tech tree with a small side board that has um, kind of a little galactic map of varied planets that you planets that you can kind of network around uh, so each player has resources which are their cubes they look like dice they're the same size as the roll for galaxy dice but you don't roll them they're effectively resources with four different sides they start off as little packed up cubes and then you might unpack unpack them into people or spaceships of various different numbers 
um, and uh, go out and explore the stars. Everything is that it's a, effectively a worker placement game where all your workers start locked up in these little columns. Um, I I just I really enjoy really enjoy this game a great deal. Um, it's unique, it's fresh, and it's taken the concept of the tech tree and boiled it down to hey, remember that thing you're doing on the side in Twilight Imperium where you're trying to get independent fighters because they're really cool, or War Sons because who doesn't want their own personal Death Star? Well, just just do that. Do a little bit of galactic conquering, but that's not as important. You can get points for it, but but just do this, and it's a a Euro game of committing horrific scientific atrocities. I had a game uh, recently where I was playing, and I suddenly turned to Sam, who I was playing with, and went, "Uh, uh, I've just, I've, I've just turned my people into the Borg." I, I didn't even realise it, and he goes, <laughs> "Yeah, well, that's very nice, but all my people do is deploy at killbots." Yeah, uh, actually, I... Hang on, uh, oh, hang on, I, oh, my dog is whining. I think I'm not playing Twilight Empire City Days because it takes a full evening and something because of that. Oh, it's Pam, right? The dog, <laughs> fence dog, right? Oh, I, I played a lot of the third edition, but the fourth edition is uh, actually... Uh, I have a friend with it. Uh, it's obviously impossible at this time to get to him, but... Uh, uh, I, I don't want to play Twilight Imperium anymore. It's too too, too long, uh, too complex, and too many people. Uh, th there's yeah. a lot of downtime. A lot of. Uh, it's an excellent game because it's good. It's a space epic, and uh, I I recommend it to people who want to once uh, once in lifetime, but once is enough. For yeah. that duration, um, I prefer to do a, a one shot of any RPG. <laughs> I've, 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 I'm back, and sorry about that. She she saw her best friend um, and wanted to go out and see him, but she can't. She so, was Pam, uh, right? Pam, yeah, Pam. Sure. So we were talking about uh, Planet Imperium, right? Yeah, yes, I, I heard. Yes um, and no. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I've played a bit of Twilight Imperium, and uh, I I think the tech tree, and this is better. I do agree with Audrey on respect to... And I like Twilight Imperium because it's the war game where war is the wrong choice. <laughs> war turn. But I, I don't understand how they get the fourth edition and they still can't manage to shave the time down. Um, <laughs> it, it, playing a four-player game of that, we can we used to be able to get it done in an evening um, <laughs> because we all knew what we were doing, but it, it was always tight, very close. Yeah, you have um, to do a long evening. But... It was always tight, very close. Yeah, you have um, to do a long evening. <laughs> you do. You you really, really do. A friend of mine played uh, at a convention, and I think they spent like eight hours in, in total, which was no. insane. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I played um once back when I used to live in Rondekun and Taff, which is... The... Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I played um once back when I used to live in Rondekun and Taff, which is the valleys. Everybody came up for a weekend, and we played a full preset map eight player um job with all the warp gates and everything and we still didn't get it finished because people got so far into the negotiating that <laughs> it, ju it just whenever you play any kind of game like this he thinks if you're not involved in a fight uh <laughs> you're not having a good time i don't recall if i told the story of jim playing game of thrones to you guys or not no I don't think so. <laughs> okay so we're playing um we're playing get the Game of Thrones fantasy flight game. I will, yep. I will get back onto Beyond the Sun, but uh, at some point uh, we will, we will, yeah. Um, so we're playing Game of Thrones. I was playing as who's the Yellow House. Uh, actually, I I didn't play the board game, but I read the book. So what's the what's the the standard? They're, they're, they're on the they're on the right hand side with the island and everything right inside the map. There's um, is uh, it the original king? The ex, ex, initial king. Uh, the initial king is Baratheon. It has a, a Baratheon. As, yes, yeah. yes, yes, Baratheon. Yes, so I was playing as Baratheon, and I was involved in a basically a Cold War standoff with Stark, and to, to the south Martell, because we were playing the six-player game, yeah. um, and to, to the south Martell, because we were playing the six-player game, yeah. um, and uh, the trouble is we were all in a three-way balance of like if any of us did anything wrong, one of the others, um, well, I would capitalized on it but i was under pressure on both fronts so jim was playing as uh, lannister the red so jim was playing as uh, lannister the reds 
Yeah. And he looks at this, and because I'm not moving troops around very much, and neither is House Stark and neither is Martell, so Stark was Andy and Martin was Martell, he thought we were all doing nothing and not having fun. And so this Jim's one of those people who, if you're not throwing war, um, whereas I love I love the political part. I like a, a war game which never actually goes to war, but sits there in, in the Cold War state. So he came over and attacked um, one of my major provinces, the most important one. And at this point, he was already involved in a fight with House Greyjoy and uh, whoever the Greens are. Barthi- uh, Baratheon, Lannister, Stark and Targaryen. Martell. Think, Cal- yeah. And Martell. Uh, Yes, yeah. So he's already involved in a fight with Martel and with uh, Tyrell, I think. Tyrell, yeah. Tyrell, the Rose. The Greens, Tyrell is the Rose. And Greyjoy, who were nearby him as well. Greyjoy um, is the is the octopus. Is the kraken? Yes, it is. Yeah, the, yeah. So he was already, and then he, and and I was just like, why are you doing this? Like, I don't have the resources to deal with fighting on this front, and you're already fighting on three fronts. What are you doing? And he's like, oh, you're not, you're not involved. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, I, I I said well that I, that can't stand I can't I can't deal with you uh, I I pres- I said well that I, that can't stand I can't I can't deal with this you've messed up my supply lines just and, and tipped the balance so I retaliated attacked and he went oh, I was just going to hold the place for a turn that old classic I just need this one town I'm just I'm not going to invade any further and anyone does that to me I'm like no no I need this one town I'm just I'm not going to invade any further and anyone does that to me I'm like no no I know how that goes somebody says I'm going to I'm just taking this one town and next thing you know they're like oh I just need to take just just one more and before you know it they're not on the door of your main capital and you're like oh great uh i should have done something earlier and i've lost all my resources so i retaliated and wiped out all he had done something earlier and i've lost all my resources so i retaliated and wiped out all his troops which is quite hard to do in game of thrones you have to hit them and then hit them again um when they're exhausted uh so that started a snowball um jim ended up uh, losing his last troop and having nothing but a boat on the board, which under the rules, you cover rules, you can't be just a boat. So it's the only time I played Game of Thrones and somebody got eliminated. But that's like, <laughs> I don't, I, that... I was always like, I don't want to sit next to Jim when we played these games. And Andy um, Chandy, uh, my other friend, he's another warmonger like that. I'm like, I don't want to sit next to these people. I like them, but their play style doesn't gel with mine. I want to sit next to these people. I like them, but their play style doesn't gel with mine because there's no negotiating borders, <laughs> territories, and working out a deal. They will eventually just chuck their troops at you. And if you retaliate, they'll just come in back in with more until you both have nothing left. And I'm like, well, that, that's not what Twilight Imperium is. It's about scoring points. <laughs> Game is not really about taking territory. It's about taking the right territory. Anyway, beyond the sun, <laughs> to get back on It's completely topic. different from this. It's completely that different. should be called side <laughs> tech. Yeah, it does. It does have a little bit of territory taking from each other on this sideboard where you've got a net. Uh, uh, the, the randomly dealt out they're, they're semi-seeded at the start and effectively you turn some of your cubes into ships and go and uh, temporarily take control of them for bonuses or you can permanently take control of them um, by removing them for, from the board by uh, spending enough ships to call it hey that's like yours for uh forever and you get another bonus and you get some points at the end the game also has various achievements for example um colonizing four systems the first person to do that will get four points the second with three and so on um transcendence is first person to score a level four tech tech which is quite hard to do um and then there's some randomized ones as well that can crop up but uh, uh the tech tree is um definitely the whole centerpiece of the game it's at the start you have your you have basic spacefaring and that gives you a bunch of different actions and they they have varied spaces so basic spacefaring for example only has four spaces um, for tech so once all four spaces are taken for tech this is in a four player game sorry i should say um, you you can't you can't like do tech again until you move somewhere else so and the tech is broken into robotics terraforming genetics and um a kind of like lasers and stuff like red they're, like, they're effectively colored um in different ways and you will yes military yep mm. yeah. so you you will do like a so for basic spacefaring you make 
and you'll put a one of your cubes from your supply, one of your wo worker cubes, onto that spot. And um, that means you've got less cubes for the rest of the game, but you get access to the uh, ability. Some of the um, techs you get here give you like an immediate bonus. So just give you an example, advantage. Some of the um, techs you get here give you like an immediate bonus. So just give you an example, advanced robotics lets you automate and gain an ore. So automating is this process where you improve these tracks at the bottom of your player board. Um, in this case, it's, uh, it improves your ore production and for the rest of the game, whenever you is this process where you improve these tracks at the bottom of your player board. Um, in this case, it's, uh, it improves your ore production and for the rest of the game, whenever you do um, your uh, production step in your turn, you'll, you may generate more ore. Um, you, the other resource is population growth. Production step in your turn, you'll, you may generate more ore. Um, you, the other resource is population growth. Now, once you get past the first tech level, things get a bit more interesting because some of the techs require you to have the correct prerequisites or even multiple prerequisites of the same type. And also when you draw, so when you draw them, finally um, innovate them, so to speak, or whatever, you have to draw a, an event which will give you something extra. So I'll give you an example here. Uh, Erratic solar activity. This card goes under an uncolized solar, solar system card and you have to pay extra ore to get there. But the system's worth more when you colonize it. So it adds a little bit of random spice to things. There's um, but the, And there's also the same for your tier three technologies. Now, the real joyous crunch of all of this, though, is in those technologies um, and how they join together. So whenever you it, um, choose to into it so blue has to pick blue yellow has to pick yellow or if um, you've got one where blue and yellow are both connecting in then you can choose either one some examples off our um, advanced robotics is for tier level two we might do hypercomputing or maybe psionics research or if you're a bit and this is joyous thing of where you kind of get far enough down and you look at the technologies you've personally chosen to make and you have that Mitchell and Webb moment of, uh, are we the bad guys? <laughs> Possibly, yeah. Are, are we the baddies? <laughs> yeah, are we the baddies? I, I kind of think we might be the baddies. Uh, and I had that because, I mean, I um, metahuman chambers, hive mind computing, um, and uh, like cybernetics or something uh, of my things, and I was like, oh, oh dear, I've 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 made the Borg, <laughs> and and um, it, it's it's wonderful because it builds up. This tablet builds up the technologies you unlock. Everybody can jump in to also unlock them, but they don't have to. So you get an asymmetry in the game as you go along, as you follow your own path, and. We're just talking about the basic game here. There's even a whole tech drafting system for the advanced like versions, and um, it's just it's just oh, it, it, this game really has to be played to, to appreciate how good it is. And I wish I'd had time to show you guys it, but when I first tried to organise this, um, the tabletop simulator mods were all taken down uh, because Rio Grande wanted to put their own one up, um, which they have done. As I done, as I said, and it's free to anyone who has tabletop simulator can just play this, and I really commend them for that. Uh, it's it's just it's it's very um, functional the way it looks, but that's that's beyond the sun for you. The the imagination, the joy is in developing the technology and seeing how technology and seeing how your particular group of humans have have moved on and and everything. It's very crunchy without being overwhelming. And um, I, I really look forward to seeing what the, what Dennis K. Chan is going to be doing in the future, because if this is his, his first, if this is his, his first attempt, um, I, you know, he's going to hopefully go on to really big things. Um, there is an expansion coming as well in the pipeline, which would be nice, because one of the things I will say is the game could do with more varied technologies and more events, because you pretty much, um, while it's Random, um, while it's randomized by the path you go down and a little bit randomized in the order in which you may get things and what you'll choose to pick from the options you have, uh, there is a finite limit to the combinations within this game. Um, yeah. So are you in the mood for a bit of Q&A? 
I certainly am. A bit of Q&A? I certainly am, yes. Ask away. Okay, first question. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, am I wrong in assuming that Mr. Chan the, just thought, hey, tech trees are fun, let's make a game about tech trees? That's pre I, I couldn't quote for him, but that is pretty much what it seems to be. Yeah, yeah, actually, that's it. So, uh, second question is, uh, I am a KDM player for a long time, mm -hmm. so I have uh, I have had the draw, draws of random innovation before. Uh, since this game has random uh, uh, tech tree advancements, uh, it could be utterly unbalanced, or is every option viable? Uh, just about every option is viable, but um, one of the advantages of this is you can look at what other people have created in their during their technological development and go you know what i don't want to gamble on some random things i can see what you're doing i want to add that to my op them and build the same technologies uh, there is also the advanced um, drafting version where you get to see a bunch of um, the text in advance so you can pick and tailor the ones that you want to fit to your choice i haven't yet seen anything that is strictly worse than anything else oh Obviously. that's that, that's cool yeah. like in kingdom death <laughs> so yeah. uh a third question and then I'm done. Uh, I am some. I am a, a guy who doesn't like a lot when resources are finite. For example, uh, here there are cubes, and mm -hmm. if I have a scientist, uh, I and I want to make a ship to turn a scientist into a ship, is this a mm. letdown? No, no, you don't. You don't necessarily turn a scientist into a ship. Uh, you you have these. You, you have these five columns of generic cubes. Uh, which um, they, they just have a little box on the top symbol and you, they turn into different things. So you're drawing from into different things. So you're drawing from those and they we will refill during your population section. Um, so some of them, like when you spend them on ships, ships are kind of eventually going to return to your pool uh, as and get packed up again. So you, you very rarely run out of resources. Um, the other resource used is the other resource used is ore, which is um, just a, a just just like a, a, you just take it when you generate it. So um, you have a finite number of resources, but you don't. Uh, you have to choose what the resource, what these resources become. You don't. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you do, and uh, and you can also make your resources more efficient with is more efficient with um, good technology or uh, usage and things like that. Okay, average duration of a four-player game. Uh, they let's see. I've only played three-player. Uh, they say about two hours. Um, and I generally had the game done within about an hour and a half with three players, so I think two hours. Three into maximizing the combos, you could probably run past two towards three hours but uh okay medium medium med heavy but not that heavy it, 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 they, they haven't rated as a three on the weight on board game geek i think that's pretty reasonable but it's more of a three on what you're thinking about doing rather than on your turn you don't do that much you place your pawn to a new action you then do the action you then do production and then if you can claim an achievement you claim an achievement and you check if the game's ended Okay. And it's points. Oh, a ending condition. What's uh, the ending condition? Oh right, you have it's um to do with the. Uh, What's uh, the ending condition? Oh right, you have it's um to do with the. Uh, I'm gonna directly read from the rule book because I always just kind of get this slightly wrong. Give me a moment. Right. Uh, yeah, it is when four total achievement discs have been placed on the achievement cards. So that's four people have achieved achievement cards so that's four people have achieved achievements and you finish the current round okay um, yeah so it, all it, that's it, left is this, playing yeah seriously i would uh, i would thoroughly recommend playing this and keeping an eye out for when it's in stock it's not expensive uh, yeah at all uh, yeah at all it's um uh, it was expensive right now because it's hard to get but uh, it's a um a power grid sized box Power grid yeah. Concordia sort uh, of size. I I I looked at the price tag is like sixty dollars uh, around sixty dollars uh, around yeah which is a bit expensive and the game it's, is good it's always worth it. <laughs> yeah, it's expensive because of the sheer number of those plastic cubes. There's a quite a lot per player. 
Um, so that's what's adding a lot of value. I will I absolutely love the idea of these um, using cubes as resources and having them turn into different sides, which I think yeah. isn't... Um, the way that this has been set up with them being in different columns is really neat because your population growth, um, as you improve your population growth through technology, um, you uncover tokens on the population growth track and they give you the ability to replenish the different piles. So you'll be drawing most from them, these piles will run out um, and you replenish from the right hand side. So pile E is the pile that replenishes first. Uh, so, so you do have like a, to manage and work out how much you want to grow your population. It's yeah, I, okay. I wish, wish so much we'd had a chance to be able to play this before we started. But um, I talking about this, even if I can't do it full justice, I really want to say like this is a a heavy recommendation from me. If it is in stock and you are remotely interested in this unique, unusual game. Um, this like medium weight euro with a very interesting take on interesting take on on style that's this new you just just you should get it because shut up and sit down are going to talk about it at some point soon and then it's going to be impossible to get and so. this uh, ladies and gentlemen was our shortest game of the day <laughs> <laughs> um, short, short question like uh, you said our shortest game of the day <laughs> <laughs> Um, short, short question. Like uh, you said, it's like a Euro kind of game. How interactive? Yeah. Uh, how, how much interaction is there with uh, other players? Well, um, you're f like constantly. Um, if you're first person to develop a particular technology bracket, you'll get the event bonus. Um, if you're first person to develop a particular technology bracket, you'll get the event bonus. But if other people have developed those technologies, then you can look at what they've done and follow that. Uh, and then there's the bit I haven't even gotten into in detail, the galactic board where there's planets and you're going to be jostling back and forth to, to see who has control of those and perhaps even. So it's not like direct um, conflict uh, as such, except on the galactic board where it's a little bit of that. Um, but there is definitely you're paying attention to what other people are doing more than some euros. Ah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. I will check it out for sure. Yeah. Right. Uh, it's time for me a game that I absolutely adore. Uh, and so, Audrey, would you like to talk to us all about this newest offering that's appearing on GameFound? Yeah, we are going to talk about Robinson Crusoe. I think I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing it the right way because it's the French way. Um, uh, I think it's not Crusoe exactly. in English. Hmm? How, yeah, how, yeah, in how, French, sorry. we have the A at the end. But... How is it in French? Crusoe. Okay, cool. Yeah. Like, uh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> so this uh, one is a game uh, which includes tech tree, of course, and it's a bit more about uh, survival, which of a few characters, of course, it follows the basic pitch, uh, which is people on an island that have to survive. And it's a cooperative game. And I think by now our listeners know that I am a cooperative games fan. So that's... So it and I was like, oh, seems interesting. And uh, I think that one of the fun thing about this game is that around gaming session, you will pick a scenario and you will try to do the goals of the scenario. And that is good for replayability because you don't follow the same objectives every single time. Uh, there are also a few stories in the scenario, so as well for the people that like a narrative experience, it seems like a really good. Also, as well for the people that like a narrative experience, it seems like a really good uh, offering. So each player chooses a character. I think that two players uh, playing together can pick two characters each based on the descriptions. I don't think it's a problem. If you want to. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes uh, with my boyfriend, that's something. I don't think it's a problem. If you want to. Yes, yeah. sometimes uh, with my boyfriend that's something that we like to do because the games can sometimes feel too limited when you have only one character, especially if they have different actions. And here they have a unique skill where you have to spend the resource determination to activate the skill. And so yeah, that might be interesting to maybe do alternate games with one character each and two characters each just to see how it differs. Yeah, you can also play with... Um... Friday and the doggo so instead of having two extra characters in full you can have Friday along who gives you like half a character um, so that's another way of doing it 
Yeah, if you have uh, to assign characters each day for missions, whether it's uh, about building, about hunting for food, uh, making, uh, taking care of the camp. Um, so that seems to be that you have to choose and to choose wisely. And uh, if you choose to send two characters hunting or one character on each task, because you may make sure that the tasks get done or have some risk. So I think there's going to be an interesting uh, case of choose your danger. Yeah, that you did with my bit is how good that mechanic is, where every player has two actions and they can choose to devote both actions to the same thing that they're doing and do it without any risk. Or you can spread yourself out a bit, but you you may you have to roll some dice and you may fail and you may have a bit of a bad journey at the time. You might eat some terrible experience behind a bush. Yeah, we played with my boyfriend uh, above and below recently, and it's the same. When you send uh, people exploring, you have to choose how many people you send exploring. The more people you have, the more dice you reroll, and so the more chance you will have to score points to succeed the exploration. So, but it will choices, and I think that's interesting. As we mentioned, we have the tech trees, which will help you build the camp and what a camp it is. Yeah, it's quite fun, the, the tech tree bit. You need to find the right tile by exploring with the right resources, and then that will let you build the particular technology and leverage towards other technologies that you can build. They're all very basic and simple, like here's a campfire, here's a shovel, here's a knife, and so on. But uh, it's really evocative. I mean, that's what you can expect on a lost island, even though reinventing the shovel can seem a bit sad. <laughs> no, I, I mean, let's be honest, uh, but uh, the camp innovations are fueled with the first stretch goal, which is a modular camp where you can have add uh, the doors, add roofs, etc. And that's both a fun uh, stretch goal. And well, at the same time, it's a bit stupid because that's useless, but and well, at the same time, it's a bit stupid because that's useless, but it's complete fluff complete um bling yeah I, i'm gonna have a little bit of a, a buyer's guide on this one right at the end of the segment because <laughs> uh, i think there is a correct route to pick on this one right at the end of the segment because uh, i think there is a correct route to picking up in this and then there's the rest of it is how much do you want to spend how, yeah. much, <laughs> how much playing you want yeah i, I, I... Actually, this the deluxe edition in the current Kickstarter. I, I hope there's time when, when this episode airs for people to get in the Kickstarter. I think uh, it's not a Kickstarter, it's on Game Found anyway. And uh, I think the pledge manager will stay open after for a while. I think I read as much, I don't know, because there are a few campaigns ending and uh, beginning these days. So I don't, know, I don't know if I'm referring to the correct one. But... Uh, the collector's edition does a good job of everything and that about base building that's actually an an actual base in the, yeah yeah in the offering yeah yeah i've i've often said um here and there that uh, robinson crusoe is every kingdom death wishes it was in regards to the settlement constructing um because robinson crusoe is one of those games that nails survival every single turn you need a whole bunch of things you cannot do everything you need to do and you have to make hard decisions getting enough food building shelter bells but it's just oh it, it is uh, survival done badly can be very frustrating um uh, it, it can feel like just busy work why are you padding out this game please this is getting in the way of the good stuff but robinson crusoe is very much just gets it right and each scenario puts an interest as an island you need to collect a load of wood build a big fire before the ship comes by and brilliant you get rescued uh, otherwise well tough luck but some of the other scenarios change that uh, you can be on the island and there's a volcano erupting in which case kind of not so much about like building a permanent camp there maybe something else or island and there's a volcano erupting in which case kind of not so much about like building a permanent camp there maybe something else or uh, you're a bunch of missionaries missionaries on a cursed island and it doesn't matter if you live or die as long as you get the island cleansed uh, this it's wonderful how many different scenarios there are and how scenarios on a cursed island 
And it doesn't matter if you live or die, as long as you get the island cleansed. Uh, this, it's wonderful how many different scenarios they are and how confident they were with this core mechanic that they could just stick all of these different variations on top. Yeah, the campaign includes the yeah the campaign includes the old expansions but adds mm -hmm. uh, the new adventure, the new book of adventure, uh, yeah. which uh, contains more than. Uh, 50 scenarios and I think that's going to be something really big for replayability and especially as, as an add-on it's for yeah. people that already own the, the game a 30 euros expansion to have 50 more scenarios to play I think that's a great offering yeah I, I suppose though I, I should just before we go any further then just get into the buyer's guide right now so yeah go ahead if you are interested in getting Robson Crusoe, and if you want at times, but not in a frustrating manner, if you want it, then this is how you should be getting it. Go to your local game store and buy a copy off the shelf. Okay? Just get the core game. Don't get anything else. That will last you for years. I own nothing but the core game for years, and I still haven't played all of the scenarios. Successful completion. Now then, if you really love that get the book of adventures pledge the extra 30 euros that's the best thing that they're offering on here um, that way you'll have access to the game now and you can play it now and you know you've got a ton of content coming in the future however if you want to spend more then more then that's when you should start looking at the collector's edition but it is as audrey said it's a bunch of extra point displaying it does make the game look great i love the miniatures the carpenter is cute as heck she she's cute in her artwork, but that she is so cute as a miniature. Like, oh, uh, you know, just I, just I I, I what I'm backing the I, I own it, but I'm backing the extra bling because I love having miniatures and I feel like it's going to add a bit more to the experience that I already find very immersive. Um, the expansions just before we get back, uh, of the two. Miss, uh, Mystery Tales is Tales is nice. It adds, introduces horror and gives you a consistent campaign. But I think the treasure chest is the better one. It has two more characters in it. It has a ton of like little modules that add experience uh, extras to the game and everything. And that's the one that I, I I of the two I have I think is the better purchase. So I would my rec I would my recommendation would be if it's available in your local store, buy the main game now, play it a bit, and decide whether you want to just get the book of adventures on the pledge or if you want to upgrade i don't see any reason to just jump in and get the everything new pledge um if i uh, did if it anyway poss <laughs> okay uh, <laughs> fine improving the gameplay um of the core experience the like they just upgrade you can get the upgrade yes i, I, but I actually have uh, i actually yeah. have a bit of insight in this if i can <laughs> Uh, th there's another thing which is important, I think, in the new stuff, which is the open adventures, uh, the open and play scenario, because uh, the manual is actually unintelligible. <laughs> the, the, it's a really a hard read, so I, I think that a new player will find uh, will find himself uh, better suited to play if they just have a uh, open and play ready adventure. Oh, uh, I'm sorry then, uh, Audrey. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah, because... Uh, I, I, I was rude. Yeah, yes, sorry. I cannot go to the game store, pick it up right now, because my game stores are in French, and this <laughs> campaign doesn't allow French, and there is no way I am playing with the game. How mm, that's a very fair reason to not follow my advice. Apparently, uh, people have been asking for a French uh, version since the beginning of the campaign. And I mean, that's the same at every single campaign. When I go to browse the Facebook uh, groups of the French web about uh, games, it's always, is there a French version? No, but then I don't play. When do they uh, have a French version? So, I mean, it's always the same. And apparently, they wanted to do the French version, but due to contracts, uh, they didn't, uh, they are not able to propose it during the campaign. And I think uh, the culprit there is, it starts with an A and it finishes with a small. <laughs> oh, Asmothoth, the all devouring publisher. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a very high probability that's it on their own side because uh, previously the translation was done by Edge, which is Spanish and French, I think, and Edge was bought by Asmodee 
Last year, two years ago, I don't remember publishers anymore, but are just translators for what Asmodee gives them. And they said, we can't do that. That's like a, a 90s Microsoft approach to buying companies. You buy that and then close it to not have concurrent in your, in your field. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> in your field yeah. <laughs> yeah so sadly yeah going to the game store and picking up off the shelf right now is not uh, is not an option for me but uh that shouldn't be a problem because uh, there should be a bit less to read than midara let's say for instance so i can handle the translation with my boy than midara let's say for instance so i can handle the translation with my boyfriend <laughs> It is it is a lot lighter to uh, on the language front. The um, board itself is language independent, pretty much, and uh, it's really just the adventure cards um, that have text on them. Yeah, so, that's yeah. like when we play. Um, that have text on them. Yeah, so, that's yeah. like when we play King's Dilemma, as the game is in English. I, uh, either I or Alexis are translating because yeah, we play in French. And that's enough because there are cards here and there, but you don't have big walls of text to read. In, oh, <laughs> sorry again. <laughs> I no, won't no, interrupt no. you. <laughs> yeah, uh, of course, you are talking to someone uh, who never gets games translated to Italian. I, I think that uh, not even Axis Mundi, which, who are Italian, uh, wa will make a game in Italian. So uh, I, I can feel that. Uh, I think that the, the, ol the only company who does uh, uh, consistent Italian translation is Awaken Realms, and that comes at the cost of getting your game two years later. Well, I think here, here with Robinson Crusoe, there is English for some, uh, Italian, sorry, I think there is Italian, some uh, components, Spanish, German as well, so that's not bad in itself, mm. but Axis Mundi, maybe, I don't, I'm not sure, but maybe they will make a PDF in Italian, that might be, I don't know, that, you have to ask them. <laughs> that depends on how much stuff is in the cards. That's actually a sensible choice because if the Italian market and the others, you first give priority to the stuff which will go internationally. So th that's a sensible choice. Of course, uh, I complain. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah. The, the Italian and French markets are as reluctant as each other to play in English. <laughs> yeah, there is an Italian first edition of uh, of, uh, of Robinson Crusoe Adventures. Though. Yeah, it was released yeah. in 2014. Yeah, the, the the original one wa was tra was translated to Italian, or or as, or at least I remember uh, something like that. But the new version is not going to get translated, so that that, that is the case uh, at least for now. So that so that that is the case uh, at least for now. So the same day, as if responding to Alessia's wish, an Italian version got announced. As if they tried to make our podcast inaccurate. But thanks to the power of editing, we stay relevant. Podcast inaccurate. But thanks to the power of editing, we stay relevant. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I, I, I genuinely think uh, this is just one of my favorite cooperative games. And I enjoy how, as long as one person knows the rules pretty well, anyone can kind of pick it up because you get the basics which is you don't may not know exactly how you do it but you'll understand you need to explore the island uh you need to build things to help you survive build shelter it's all like classic tropes that we, we yeah. know yeah i'm very happy i pledge for it because i think that's going to be a favorite uh france is waiting on a restock of paleo currently and on a few mechanics, the game seems very close to each other. So there might be a bit of an overlap in my collection. But um, that's not a big deal. I have uh, have both. And I do feel that um, Robinson Crusoe, Paleo, I feel, is um, a lot lighter. So okay. it's, it's, yeah. So um, maybe Paleo to play with my parents. And hmm. the other one for both of us when we are in a more hardcore mood. Well, uh, I, well, as I say, that's pretty much the recommendations. And I think for this is um, the campaign finishes, but even if it doesn't, hopefully the um, backer kit will still be open, uh, or the pledge manager. Um, and I really do think you you should be getting it one way or another. If you can get it in English and you're happy with it in English, pick it up in the store and get the extra bits further down the line. 
because to be honest, just the base game should last you a couple of island, I think it is. Um, I really should. But uh, yeah, uh, well, uh, all that's really left to say is that this this interesting how wide and broad this um, game is, uh, considering it's based on a English novel, really, um, by one Daniel Defoe, who by one Daniel Defoe, who comes from one of those wonderfully English named places, Cripplegate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. So uh, we're we're going to be enjoying a wonderful tangle through some. Uh, particularly spectacular British names with our final game for the uh, for the episode spectacular British names with our final game for the uh, for the episode and that is Brass Birmingham okay Birmingham from Birmingham. going from going from uh, outer space to the beautiful audience now we go to the sooty roads and kennels of sooty roads and Kennels of uh, Birmingham. <laughs> you have to be sad when you say it. I, I try. I try it. Birmingham. You don't have to be sad when you say it, but if you go to Birmingham, then you will be sad. <laughs> I, I kid to anyone who happens to be from Birmingham who's no one, so I'm going to say it again Birmingham sucks. <laughs> oh, take it away, oh, David. Oh, okay, we, we, we are hemorrhaging listeners. Or one uh, of them. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're going to talk about Brass Birmingham, and uh, yeah, there were several like uh, alliteration, alliterations of the skate by Martin Wallace in 2007. Uh, Brass was released, and at the later on, um, I think 2018, Brass Birmingham and Lancashire were released. So they they are like uh, yeah, the same game but different, and. Uh, so it's a game that takes place in the Industrial Revolution in the area around Birmingham. And uh, between the years 1770 uh, and 1870. And you take the role of uh, several entrepreneurs. It's a, you can play with two to four players. And de develop um, yeah, the industrial area and that's, uh, on, the, on the board with like the different lovely Named place places, <laughs> I think a fan can is the only one who actually can pronounce some of these places. I want Evan there. <laughs> yeah, I, I I can and I will at, at some point. But uh, yeah, um, I'm not going to go through all the names yet. But I do have a list of all of the places in Brass Birmingham with a fact about each one that I will go through near the end. Uh, I, I just want to say um, to add to your. Uh, history before you get back your uh, history before you get back to describing how the game works um one of the things i particularly love is martin wallace was being told by people that they thought he was developing like soft pansy games like oh, these are too easy you'll be too gentle with your players so he went well i'm just going to spite all of you and he made brass which is which is really prickly, like a very <laughs> sticky, nasty game at times. Lots of I I, I joked when we were playing um, yesterday that I uh, was it yesterday no the day before was it yesterday or the day before. Uh, well, anyway, when we played earlier this week, the day I before. joked. Yeah, the day before. before. I, I joked after we'd finished that the universal sound of brass is, um, <sighs> as you're constantly I... like, I want to do this. No, wait, I can't. I can't. Mm. I got to do this first. I got to do this first. Yeah, that, that, those were my last three turns. <laughs> so um, I'm going to explain how Brass Birmingham works. Um, basically, your main target is to get as many victory points as possible. And you do that by scoring points by doing different actions. Every player has two different actions in every round, which is like build an industrial site on, on, uh, on one of the locations. You have like those little pieces like you have your board where you have all those uh, your tech tree pretty much and then you have like uh, industries like uh, coal mines iron mines you have uh, I think it's like uh, cotton then you have um, uh, tiles and I think I forgot something the beer yeah Be beer, beer how, boxes. How, 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 beer. Yeah. Yeah, how could you're I forget beer you're a bad beer? German you're a bad German uh, yeah, I am. I really am. <laughs> so uh, then you try to build those uh, 
those industry up and you can connect those different places by networks first you have you start in the uh, kennel age but it means yeah, you can only place a single industrial tile on one of those places and then you can con connect them by uh, ships you have those little ships which connect those places and then you build a network which is important later on yeah, um, this is historically matching the way that uh, things went in Britain where canals were first used to move coal until the canals got all choked up and Stevenson came along with his rocket. So furthermore, then you can develop, which means you actually like you remove tiles from your playing board, your own one, which sounds like a bad thing to do in the beginning, but uh, actually you remove like the tiles, which means the next time you build something, you build like uh, the higher the higher tier things. Um, then you can sell your wares, which is like sell cotton, manufacture manufactured goods, and your pottery. And you can take a loan, which will reduce your income, but you get like which will reduce your income, but you get like thirty pounds. And you can scout, which means like you exchange two cards. Uh, for two wild cards, uh, one wild card location, one wild industry card, which means you will be, you will lose one action, but in return you will, you get to choose where you want to place your next building, or you will lose one action, but in return you will, you get to choose where you want to place your next building or at which at which location, which is sometimes pretty nice. Yeah, that was a new mechanic which wasn't in the original brass. It's one of the things that's helped soften the game a bit and make it more accessible. So, how how soften the game a bit and make it more accessible? So, how how do you play this game? Which is like the interesting part is like um, you build those tiles and then you try to figure out a way how to flip those tiles because then they score you points, score you points, and uh, they give you income, which is like your main. Uh, like the one of the most important things in the game you want to get uh, money every round otherwise you can uh, end up in bankruptcy <laughs> which is not a nice thing to do and how do you flip those tiles there are two ways to do this uh, one thing for manufactured goods you sell them at a, um, you have to connect your tiles e either by your own links or like ships like uh, via the canals or later on via rails and trains and to one of those uh, merchant places where you can then start selling those things but if you want to s <laughs> so like in everything in the, in life yeah and uh, the thing is um the first player who like sells something there um, you can do it pretty much for free because there's be available at the at the place but later on you need to you can flip your tile which means like on the other side of the tile there are the victory points which will be scored at the end of the the age and later on the second time during the uh, rail age and um then there's a like a score which means like uh, it's your income like if you flip those tile uh, industrial tiles which is like uh which is uh, coal and iron. Those things are needed for uh, building other buildings, like the or pretty much every other building. And the interesting thing is, if you want to build, let's say you want to build a like a coal. The interesting thing is, if you want to build, let's say you want to build a like a coal mine and you need iron for it, then it will take it either from the from the uh, from the local market which you have to buy or you will take it from another player who already built an iron mine and then you have to take one of those tiles who get placed on top of them when, or you will take it from another player who already built an iron mine and then you have to take one of those tiles who get placed on top of them when you build them uh, we will take them off and once all those pieces are removed from those from the tile you flip you flip those industrial building and then it will score income f either for you, those industrial building and then it will score income f either for you or the other player which is like really interesting mechanic i haven't played a comedy based game that has so many interactions like you always think about if you build something let's say you build um, an ironworks and then you have to pay like coal and that coal will be taken from the next coal mine but that belongs to your your uh to the other player and 
that could cause it to happen to flip those those uh, coal mine tile, which will score points and income for him. So you always have to check like what you're going to do, and there's like this yeah special kind of interaction and everything is connected somehow. Mm. Well, we've all four of us played Brass Birmingham now. Um, I've, I, I, I'll just start with uh, briefly with, with me. Um, mm -hmm. I have three copies of Brass uh, for each day of the exciting Brass weekend, of course. Um, it's it's more of um, back when I was in university and I was studying, I couldn't, I, I couldn't drink, but uh, I could play board games. And so I went to my local board game shop, which is one of the places I ended up working and eventually running um i uh i i picked board game geek at the time and it was quite highly rated it's called brass and i it's the 2007 first edition i have um which it, it could almost sound like a brag except it's the worst edition you could possibly have <laughs> it is it looks like ass because tree fog was still doing war games so it's ugly everything that um uh, other reviewers did of uh, the 2007 version, Tree Fog version. I was like, they've got an inlay, they've got metal coins. What? This is uh, this is unheard of. <laughs> Such luxury. I just have a bunch of chits and bags. This is ugh. Um, but then Stop the reprints came out, and uh, Oshir has been better balanced, but also they're gorgeous. I I cannot state uh, how wonderful it is that they that that is it Roxley. Roxley yeah, Roxley. Yeah. Roxley. Roxley. Roxley looked at this and went, uh, you know what? We're printing these boards, these player boards. We could just put like black on the trail, or no, we're going to give you a choice. You can play in wonderful Shropshire uh, during the daytime. Here it is, nice and pretty. Or if you want to be moody about it all, you can play with the night boards. Or if you want to confuse everyone, then you can all play different yeah. ones. <laughs> yeah, where 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 you cannot read anything. Yeah, I think it's I think it's just yeah where 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 you cannot read anything. Yeah, I think it's <laughs> I think it's just fantastic that they looked and went. You know what? We're going to give you more of this beautiful artwork, um, and make use of the backs of the boards. I think they could have maybe changed the roots on the backs and said, "Hey, here's some alternative roots. These are not historically accurate, but alternative roots. These are not historically accurate, but uh, have a different game." Um, but either way, like I, I, I love it. I love everything. Um, I, I also appreciate them taking the time to find some uh, female industrialists from the period. Although it's a little telling that they could only find two, only find two, and of one uh, of those, only Eleanor isn't a, someone who was widowed into it. She's she's fantastic. She's really worth reading about. They put a little blurb about each of them in the um in the manual in the manual. Um, and uh, like they are names you'll go, oh, I've heard of this person before. For the most, go, oh, I've heard of this person before. For the most part, uh, Isambard Brunel, uh, uh, Isambard Kingdom Brunel. Um, built Bristol Temple Meads, the train station. If you ever go to Bristol, that's the train station you want to look at. I recommend getting off there in Bristol and having a look at that area. You can even go a little bit north of Bristol Temple Meads, Bristol Temple Meads, on foot to Queen Square and see where the Yogs cast have their offices and shout the boo, you suck. They don't <laughs> suck, but uh, they, they actually do some great board game stuff as well on their YouTube channel at times um but yeah it's I, I i originally the game didn't have any personalities for the different colors you were just a color these for the different colors you were just a color um and I, I so i appreciate them trying to tie things in a bit more to the time but also they you know can you have found two more women maybe you know it's, but uh you know it's but uh, you know, I, I I appreciate the attempt, and it is nice to have a bit more historical. Um, Women, what's that? Oh yeah, <laughs> well, it wasn't like during Victorian times and in the industrial period, etc., that the women were in charge of the money in Britain. No, they didn't handle all of that. Running the house, uh, you know. Back to the game. <laughs> um. Yeah. So that was my first, and for now only. Um game of Brass Birmingham. Uh, I spent lots of time reading the city names with the stupid French accent, like Worcester, for fun. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I thought that yeah, the, the game isn't really hard. 
in itself but there are many different moving parts uh, that well not moving part but different mechanisms that you have to remember like when you can build where because you have a card because you don't have the card uh, these kind of limitations you really have to it takes a few turns to remember them and even after an hour of gameplay you may find out that ah, I'm not sure I can do that <laughs> but th that's part of the game I think um, I did um, my tiles until at some point Fen told me eh, hey, you could develop and then you're going to score big points yeah and, and then, then you scored more points than me yeah I mean that, that was that was a good suggestion uh, but I didn't think about that myself because yeah, it's too many things to think about and uh -huh, actually I can't uh, ah, <laughs> I had a few turns like that but I mean that's that's okay uh, I really enjoyed uh, when I had some at, in the second part of the game I thought I had more control over what I was doing partly because I had now a bit of experience with the game also because that's when I started building beer <laughs> and that's when we use more beer to build the rails. That, that doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> you yeah. use more beer to build the rails. Yeah, yeah that's for the workers. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> lubricate, lubricate all of that transportation and all that building, yeah. So, yeah, and uh, phase was more interesting. Also because you've built up uh, also your uh, income over the first one. And during the second one, that's when you feel you can do things. And I think that's really interesting because in in many uh, agile building games or uh, uh, resource building games, you often think that all the game ends when you feel like, yeah, you're starting to have something built and you can't enjoy what you built uh, at some point. And in this one, yeah, the first phase ends at the time where you're like, eh, I could do things now, but you have a second phase when you, the first phase ends at the time where you're like, eh, I could do things now, but you have a second phase when you, in theory, can do things unless you completely end in a corner uh, of the board and you can't uh, get out of it, etc. But I think that you have the potential in general to really feel that you do. But I think that you have the potential in general to really feel that you do things during the second phase. And I think that's interesting. Yeah, it is. It's a very underused mechanic in board games to have this. You build this infrastructure and then halfway through the game, it all falls apart effectively and your industry here and there. And then it's time to decide how you want to reconnect everything. Yeah, yep. that's actually a winning mechanic in in Br uh, at least Birmingham because I didn't play Lancashire. So uh, the, the 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 transition from uh, Canal to Railroad is actually when magic happens because you you have a lot of more a lot more of options when you begin Railroad era, and that really makes the game shine. I think that if you played it continuously by just removing canals at some point, it uh, wouldn't be, wouldn't be, wouldn't play the same, wouldn't feel the same. So yeah. that's a big plus. It also would be historically accurate, and that was one of the big things that uh, Martin Wallace aimed for. And I've, I've watched film videos from uh, people who are experts in the Industrial Revolution historically, and they really enjoyed the game, got quite engrossed with it, and went on. And... Yeah. Uh... Oops, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, uh, no, 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 I was no, no. just... <laughs> okay, we'll do this for the entire episode. So, <laughs> uh, the, the, the historical accuracy was so important that actually the manual justifies everything that uh, looks like an arbitrary decision in the game. For example, beer, actually in England, and that is why there are so many more pubs than in other places in Europe, actually. Uh, in England, uh, in uh, the United Kingdom, it was easier to have beer than drinkable water because of pollution. Um, it was easier to have beer than drinkable water because of pollution and uh, poor water sources, I guess. And that's why you need beer to build a lot of railroads and sell stuff. Or, uh, of course, I, I don't know this by and sell stuff. 
or uh, of course I, I don't know this by myself I just read the manual <laughs> so that's a game where read the <laughs> manual is definitely great yeah yeah <laughs> RTFM yeah but also it's interesting yeah they do put a... RTFM yeah but also it's interesting yeah they do put a lot of historical details into the into the manual um speaking of which i'm gonna quickly run through the places in shropshire in which this is set so um as i said before <laughs> the birmingham area is um is the inspiration for lord of the rings uh beyond where everyone wants to go because um Tolkien, I guess, really wanted to go uh, to uh, Wales. Are you about to say that Birmingham is Mordor? Birmingham is Mordor. He said b industrial <laughs> Birmingham was Mordor. You know, it, it, it had that fearsome orange glow and, and smoke billowing out of it. You know, that to, I wanted to go into the, uh, the the different places on the map just so people can hear the pronunciations and have a single <laughs> fact about each one. So, Belper is where Timothy Dalton was raised, one of the Bonds. Uh, I also really enjoyed Timothy Dalton in World's End, which is a pub crawl movie. Dalton in World's End, which is a pub crawl movie. Uh, Derby has the world's second largest aero engine, engine manufacturer. Uh, Coventry uh, has St. Michael's Cathedral and is also where uh, two of my friends, the painters Fluff and Fury, live. Uh, Stoke-on-Trent. Stoke-on-Trent. Very bad reputation, lots of crime by its reputation, and actually it's a poor area, so you kind of don't go to Stoke-on-Trent. Who would like to pronounce this next one on my list? Yukes, yuk, yuk something. Yukes, it's there. It's Otterture. <laughs> Otterture. Um, <laughs> It, the, the is a uh, like the most fun name on there to pronounce for me, Otterger. Uh It um, Alton Towers is nearby. It's also like uh, one of the places very famous for beer. Um, then we have Birmingham. It's got tons of canals. Um, I went there uh, for training quite a few times. Stayed overnight in the place and, and in Coventry. Uh, shopping centre is called the Bull Ring for some reason. It looks like a mess of mirror discs stuck onto a, a, a building. Um, then there's Dudley. That's one of the birthplaces. Harry Potter. Yeah, Dudley. Yeah, yes, the, exactly. the cousin Dudley yeah. Dursley. <laughs> yeah. Um, speak. Yeah. Then there's Warsaw, which didn't get a railway until 1847, uh, despite being like really important. This was 48 years after uh, canals, so they got quite left behind. There's Burton on Trent. Um, it used to dominate the mind. There's Burton on Trent. Um, it used to dominate the brewery trade. Uh, still. Um, has a, a Bass Beer and Marston's. Uh, the Stafford has the la largest timber framed house in England, the Elizabethan Ancient Height. It's really like Stafford is a nice place to visit. The Elizabethan Ancient Height. It's really like Stafford is a nice place to visit. Uh, Leek is the um, the Welsh national uh, vegetable. Uh, stone. I had Leek yeah. today. <laughs> That's yeah. Leek. I was on theme. <laughs> Uh, stone uh, is a thing you walk on. Now it has a, a bronze yeah. age, has a, a bronze yeah. age ring ditch in Pyre Hill nearby. So like that, there's people been there for a long, long time. Um, Cannock is located near the Chase, uh, known as Cannock Chase. Uh, outstanding natural beauty there. Wonderful place to just again visit. Um, Tamworth is the birthplace of the modern concern manifesto. Robert Peel. Uh, is also the guy who set up the Metropolitan Police and the reason that in the UK policemen are called Bobbies. Or they used to also be called Peelers, which was uh, a less polite description for them. But yeah, Bobbies in the UK because of Robert Peel. Well, we uh, said chicken in French. Mm -hmm. uh, places in and around Nuneaton. Uh, Redditch was named after the red clay in the area. It has the UK's National Needle Museum. Like Whoa. a needle museum, La yeah. like spaghetti. Mm. Uh, Kidderminster <laughs> is the home of the Kidderminster Harriers Football Club. Which, mm. uh, Kidderminster <laughs> is the home of the Kidderminster Harriers Football Club, which uh, back when I was younger and was forced to play football manager with my friends would be the club I would manage rather than anything in the Premiership League, as I like the way Kidderminster Harriers sounds when you say it. 
Uh, and then Colebrookdale, very famous for its ironworks. The gate famous for its ironworks. The gates of Hyde Park were built there. And the Peacock Fountain, which is in Christchurch, New England, was also built there. And there's a ton of other ironworks. So that's all the places. That's how you pronounce them. Uh, oh, and I left one off. I've left off from the list Worcester, the home of Worcestershire sauce. Worcester Gloucester. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So that's that's all the places in Birmingham. I think we can definitely recommend um, Brass Birmingham as well. Yeah, 100%. Thoroughly enjoyable economic engine building game, um, which is as deep as you want it to be. Um, yeah, I'm yeah. an expert game. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely. very easy to learn this game. It's very difficult to master this game. Yeah, yeah, you will make a lot of mistakes trying to get anywhere through it, and uh, it's okay. oh, absolutely! <laughs> J- just, just remember that uh, Utica breweries are really strong. Yeah, that's, that's the <laughs> yeah rare oats and breweries. Yes, us can access in the Canal Age, very powerful. And ra- <laughs> railroads around Birmingham. Yeah, yeah. Any points? Many yeah, points. Birmingham, Worcester, and Worcester, and yes, that that place. Utica. 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 Ut. Ut. Yeah, yeah that. that's that, that's the the noise uh, an old make. Ut. <laughs> yeah, hundred acre woods. Yeah, the, sure. That's, yeah. It's around the corner. Um, actually, as as another additional fact about Utica, it's had uh, over seventy different names through history. <laughs> like, one more pronoun. Can't make their mind up. How are they going to name it? But why they why they took that one? <laughs> uh, well, the thing is, um, I'm why not going to get into it in big details because we're getting close to time. But Britain's um, f- uh, accents fragmented um, a great deal, and actually, if you want to hear the original British accent, listen to Kevin Costner. It was American. Something happened to change that. All the accents went parochial, and now you've got like dozens and dozens and dozens of different accents splintered across Britain there are so many of them like I uh, just within where I lived there is like six different accents in a five mile radius like about oh, six crazy. kilometers yeah yeah it's it's nuts like like about oh, six crazy. kilometers yeah yeah it's it's nuts like yeah and that's not even including people who've immigrated you know uh, uh, moved into Britain from other countries who they will of course have their own accents so Anyway, I think that brings us to all we have time for for this particular episode. That brings us to all we have time for for this particular episode. Uh, So, you can catch us over at www.patreon.com forward slash the last standee, or as the last standee on Twitter, or if you look really hard in Utterture, you might maybe not find any of us. So, until next... Goodbye from Alessio. Bye, bye. Audrey? Bye bye. David. Bye. The people next door to David drilling through the wall, which is why he's had to be quiet for so long. No, we didn't <laughs> and see myself. Match, And remember that the second E in Stan D is for environmental. <laughs> <laughs>